Okay, so I have three o'clock now, okay? Hello, bon dia. My name is Francesco Sindico. I am the co-director of the Strathclyde Center for Environmental Law and Governance at the University of Strathclyde in Glasgow, Scotland. It gives me really great pleasure to welcome you to the first Climate Change Litigation Initiative C2LI webinar, organized in collaboration with the London School of Economics Grantham Research Institute on Climate Change and the Environment. The goal of today's webinar is to shed first some light on recent developments in climate change litigation in Brazil. And there have been developments literally also in the last week. So we're all very excited for these important news coming from Brazil, but also to briefly introduce C2LI. And to do this, we have three excellent speakers whom I really thank in advance for joining us today. However, before I move on to present our speakers, just some housekeeping. Now we are running this event as a webinar and we have decided to take a bit of a blended format with the chat. So the chat is now open and I encourage you to use it until I finish presenting the speakers as a welcome. There are more than a hundred people in this, in this webinar attending from probably all around the world and it's always nice to see where you're from and who you are and so forth. But during the presentations, we will disable the chat so that we can actually focus on the presentations and really get as much out of it as possible. We will then open the chat again after when we do the Q&A. However, when it does come to the questions, as, oft, as you will know by now in the webinars, please use the Q&A box and we will do our best to ask as many questions as possible that you have asked in the second part of the webinar. Now, I have a really amazing team of collaborators within C2LI, and they will help me sorting and sharing the questions that we will be receiving. Just a wee reminder that this webinar is being recorded, and we will let you know of when it is available on the C2LI YouTube webpage. Now, without further ado, let me introduce you to our three great speakers. Our first speaker is Patricia Klien Vega, Patricia Klien Vega. Patricia is an associate at Ferro Castroneves d'Altro and Gomide Advogados, a firm based in Rio de Janeiro. And she is the author of the Brazilian chapter in the forthcoming book, Comparative Climate Change Litigation Beyond the Usual Suspects which I will mention very soon. And you can find further information about Patricia in the slide in front of you. Our second speaker is Caio Borges. Caio is the coordinator of the Law and Climate Program at the Institute for Climate and Society. He holds a PhD from the University of Sao Paulo and a master's degree in law and development from the Getulio Vargas Foundation. And Caio has been very much involved firsthand in some of the most interesting recent developments in climate litigation in Brazil. And we are extremely excited to have him with us. Our third speaker is Joanna Setzer. She's an assistant professorial research fellow at the London School of Economics Grantham Research Institute on Climate Change and the Environment. Her main area of research is climate change litigation. And since 2013, she has been involved in the Climate Change Laws of the World project. And Joanna also has had firsthand experience with the climate litigation developments happening in Brazil today, in, in these last months. Now, we will get back to our speakers very soon. But as I said, the second goal of today's webinar
Okay, hope I'm not muted now. C2LI is led by SCALD, by the Strathclyde Center for Environmental Law and Governance, in collaboration with the University of Geneva Faculty of Law and the Asia Pacific Center for Environmental Law at the National University of Singapore. And it builds on the efforts leading to the forthcoming book published by Springer, Comparative Climate Change Litigation Beyond the Usual Suspects. Now, climate, the C2LI is not a database of climate cases. It is also not an initiative for climate litigation. It is an initiative about climate litigation. Because let's be honest, we are aware that we only really have 10 years to really make a difference when it comes to dealing with climate change. Litigation will not be the silver bullet, but it will be an important part of the efforts to deal with climate change over the next 10 years and beyond. C2LI looks at litigation through three specific scenarios. The first one, an individual challenging the state for ineffective climate action, public policy climate litigation. The second scenario, an individual challenging her government for authorizing a specific project that leads to increased emissions or ineffective adaptation, public project-based climate litigation. And the third scenario, an individual challenging a private actor for operations that allegedly lead to more climate change, private climate litigation. Now, C2LI will focus on these three scenarios in specific countries and provide information focusing on standing, grounds, and remedies. And we'll refer also to non-climate specific cases that may be relevant for future climate cases around the three C2LI scenarios. Now, C2LI will provide a useful snapshot, not only of countries that have experienced climate litigation, but also of countries with little or no climate litigation. So, so to say, it goes beyond the usual suspects and covers many non-English speaking countries. In fact, C2LI and the book provide an overview of climate litigation in 30 countries around the world, which you have showcased in this slide through the scenario-based methodology. Now, you will find a lot of this in the Springer book to be published in 2021, but you will find all of it in a much more accessible format in a web platform that will be officially launched at COP26. Now, between now and then, we are working with many partners, including the law firm Clyde & Co. and the other law firm Rouse LLP to develop the platform. Now, I, I do not want to steal too much more time from our speakers, but if anybody wants to know more about C2LI, please reach out. We're always keen to work with more partners and in the long run, also include more countries within C2LI. Before I do give the floor to the first speaker, let me say a few words about Brazil as a way to put the topic of today's webinar in context. Now, many of the attendees know about Brazil and about what I'm gonna say much better than me. There are a lot of participants that are joining us from Brazil itself. But there are a few of you that maybe don't know too much about Brazil. So the next minute is for you. Brazil is not just any other country in Latin America. Brazil is the largest and most populated country of Latin America with 211 million people. Its biodiversity is second to none and it hosts the Amazon rainforest, which can be considered as the lungs of the world. Now Brazil is currently led by President Jair Bolsonaro, who took office on 1st of January, 2019. Bolsonaro's administration has been marked by a deregulatory agenda that is giving rise to national and international action from several actors. 
It is against this background that climate change litigation has increased in Brazil over the past few years. Now, without dwelling on this any further, I give the floor to our first speaker, Patricia. Thank you very much. Hello, everyone. It's a pleasure to, to be here. Thank you, Francesco, for the invitation and fellow colleagues for joining. My name is Patricia Vega, and as mentioned by Francesco, I'm a lawyer at a civil litigation law firm in Rio de Janeiro called FCDG. I was honored to contribute alongside José Roberto de Castro Neves with a chapter explaining some of the procedural and material basis for fighting climate change in Brazil. Congratulations to Francesco for organizing this book and his team, which I believe will be very useful uh, in shedding light and comparing this issue across so many borders. Although it may seem uh, to the rest of the world that Brazil is currently not so responsible in terms of the environment, we have an extremely protective legal system, which unfortunately is not always complied, and, uh, complied with and supervised. Just this morning, I saw an article stating that Biden will create a list of global outlaw countries with respect to the Paris Agreement. And everything indicates that Brazil will be on the very top of this list. So this only proves that our discussion here is extremely relevant and timely. So firstly, I will quickly go over the main grounds for the for environmental protection in Brazil, then briefly explain the most common procedural instruments available to parties and then the substantive grounds for such actions. When, to, so when discussing uh, environmental protection in Brazil, in climate change in particular, it is all, always worth starting from the most important piece of legislation that we have, which is the Brazilian constitution enacted in 1988. So article uh, uh, 225 states that, quote, everyone has the right to an ecologically balanced environment, which is an asset of public use and essential to a healthy quality of life, which imposes upon the public power and the collecti collectivity to defend and preserve it for the present and future generations. This right is known as an, a trans-individual right because it belongs not only to the individual, but also to the collectivity. And it, it is also recognized by the Supreme Court as a fundamental right. The concept of environment is defined by another law enacted in 1981 which states that the environment is a set of conditions, laws, influences, and interactions of physical, chemical, and biological nature, which permits, houses, and regulates life in all of its forms. As for climate change in particular, uh, Brazil instituted in 2009, the National Policy for Climate Change. The law was further regulated by Executive Order 7390, both of which, alongside the Paris Agreement, represented commitments to reduce greenhouse gas emissions. As for the procedural instruments available uh, to parties in Brazil, the main ones as discussed in our chapter are the popular action, uh, so-called ação popular in Portuguese, and civil public action, the ação civil pública. The popular action is an individual action in which any Brazilian citizen uh, has standing to file. It only has to show the electoral uh, registry. And it is foreseen in Article 5, par Paragraph 73 of the Constitution, as well as another specific law. And it allows any individual to file action to annul an act which is harmful to the environment or threatening to be harmful to the environment, among other assets which are covered by this, 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 this popular action. The citizen is therefore entitled to supervise acts of government. The defendant in the popular action, Asson Popular, may be the public entity and any other individuals with direct or indirect relation to the environmental threat or damage. Another very common instrument used to fight environmental threat or damage in Brazil, which we also discussed in our chapter, is the civil public action. It's called Ação Civil Pública in Portuguese, and it's a collective action in which the plaintiff is a group of people represented by public entities, government, states, agencies, foundations, civil associations, among others, these entities act as procedural substitutes for these groups of people. So it's not any individual, but these groups of uh, entities which represent them. The defendant may be, again, any individual or entity responsible for causing directly or indirectly the environmental damage or harm. 
But differently than the popular action, the protection that uh, is sought in this lawsuit is the diffuse collective and homogenous individual rights. In this, uh, in this action, the plaintiffs may seek either compensation, pecuniary compensation, or um, uh, an, an order to do something, such as, for example, stop harmful contact or, or return to the status quo ante or anything like that. Although this, uh, this was not part of our chapter, there are other remedies available for constitutional control. I think Caio and Joana will touch upon uh, uh, the recent developments in these, but they allow uh, parties to seek annulment of un unconstitutional acts, which may be actions or, or omissions, or recognize a constitutional one. Among these constitutional remedies are the ADI, ADC, or ADPF. These are some of them. The legitimate, legitimate parties for this type of concentrated control are provided in Article 103 of the Constitution, and they may, may be uh, initiated by the President, part of the Senate, governors, political parties, Federal Council of the Bar, the Brazilian Bar, which is the OAB, among other legitimate parties. Uh, in terms of Brazilian environmental substantive law, Article 14 of Law 6398 provides that polluting agents are liable for the damages they cause, quote, to the environment and to third parties affected by their activities. So here, any private or public actor can face environmental liability charges. The concept of polluting agent is defined as the physical or legal person of public or private law responsible directly or indirectly for any activity that causes environmental degradation. So as you can see, it, it, the, it's very inclusive, this idea of the polluting agent, which is why I said that in the beginning of my lecture that the problem is not necessarily with the legislation, but with, with the supervision and the complying of the legislation. In, in events where there are more than one polluting agents, all of them will be jointly liable for the damages caused. And one of the main principles in environmental liability in Brazil is the principle of full reparation, which means that agents, polluting agents, have the duty to integrally repair the damages caused. And uh, also these, these damages are also uh, damages to related ecosystems, biomes. So it's uh, the polluting agent is responsible for repairing all of this damage. The polluter can be called upon to restore, as I mentioned, the environment to the status quo ante, or when that is not possible, to indemnify the victim uh, of the damage. Of course, the restoring of the status quo ante is always preferred, even if it's more burdensome to the polluter, which is consistent with the idea that the that environmental law is more concerned with the preservation of the environment than with punishing the polluter per se. Uh, Brazilian law also foresees the strict liability of the polluting agents. This means that uh, the polluting agents can be held liable for environmental damage regardless of any culpability or misconduct. This is called in Portuguese responsabilidade objetiva, whether it is intentional or resulting from negligence. They can also be held liable even in cases where the activity is completely illicit or when the government expressly authorized this activity, being enough that uh, the party simply proved that the activity has caused environmental degradation, that in theory is enough. This is uh, also consistent with the idea that the agents must internalize the costs of the polluting activity in a principle that is known as the principle of the polluter payer, which is also foreseen in, in law 6938, which I just mentioned. Uh, according to the prevailing understanding of the Superior Court of Justice, uh, collective damages to the environment are not subject to statutes of limitations, seen as the right to a balanced environment is considered, as I mentioned before, a fundamental right of the population. As for the Brazilian courts, my colleagues will talk uh, a little bit more about the recent precedents on the matter, but I'd just like to uh, highlight one important prece precedent by Justice Herman Benjamin from the Superior Court of Justice, which states that when analyzing the nexus of causality between the actor's actions and the damage, and apologies beforehand because this is a bit of a tongue twister, but, but Justice Herman uh, says that the, there's no difference between 
quote, those who do, those who don't do when they should do, those who allow others to do, those who don't mind that others do, those who finance so that others do, and those who are benefited by others doing. This is, this is, a, a, it's a very representative of the very inclusive nature of environmental liability in Brazil. I think I'm about to uh, reach my time. Thank you very much for the attention. And I hope I was able to give a, a quick overview of the procedural and substantive grounds for fighting climate change in Brazil. Thank you. Thank you very much, Patricia. That was outstanding. And uh, uh, at the end of the webinar, we will all try the tongue twister and see how great we are with it. And that will be the mm -hmm. ultimate test. As you obviously saw, uh, I, we asked Patricia to provide uh, the context, if you want, to the Brazilian judicial system from a practitioner perspective. And we now move to our second speaker, Caio Borges, to talk to us more in detail about the developments, the recent developments in climate change litigation in Brazil. So uh, I ask you, Caio, to take it away from here. You have some slides, so feel free to start showing the slides on the screen. Thank you, Francesco. And um, I'd like to start by um, congratulating the CL2I for this great webinar. Um, we're very uh, honored to be here and very happy that this first series of webinars is kicking off with Brazil and uh, that's a lot going on here. So I think um, it's a very welcome um, event. And um, I think um, that the uh, history and the uh, background that Patricia just gave, it's very important. I think whenever we're discussing the developments in climate mitigation in Brazil, it's always good to uh, go back to what we have in terms of uh, uh, precedents and also the architecture of our um, environmental uh, legislation in Brazil. So thanks Patricia for uh, setting the stage. So um, as Francesco said, I will present an overview um, of uh, the current uh, landscape of climate litigation in Brazil. So um, I will provide some uh, statistics and then um, I will end by uh, discussing a little bit more in detail some of the most uh, important uh, climate uh, cases that are now pending before the Brazilian courts. So let me start just by uh, drawing, building on the concept of the geography of climate litigation that has been put forward by Harry Ozofsky. I think this is a, a very good uh, approach to discussing uh, climate litigation in the global south. Uh, because as we all know, the, the developing world and the developed world, they face uh, um, common challenges, but also different challenges in terms of what they have to do in mitigation and adaptation uh, to contribute to the Paris Agreement. So I think that uh, what we see, like Brazil is a case in point in how climate litigation manifests itself in, um, in accordance with the reality that we have, of course, in accordance with the profile of our emissions and in also in, in relation to the challenges that we have to make those policies effective. So, um, and much has been written about how uh, climate litigation is happening in the Global South. Joanna has uh, written a lot about this. And I think that there are some common traits that I just bring them back here very uh, um, quick, which is um, there is a tendency to uh, seek governments to be accountable for their failure to implement the existing laws and policies. So it's not a matter of, um, of a gap of laws. There, there are many uh, laws and policies, but uh, governments, uh, they tend not to implement them satisfactorily. And then um, because of the traditional constitutional uh, uh, litig strategic litigation in these countries, countries like Brazil or Colombia or South Africa or India, there's also a tendency in bringing human rights as one of the core components of these cases. And also, I think this speaks much to the reality of Brazil, the fact that there is a plurality and diversity of the involved actors. And I think this is one of the key like attributes of climate litigation in Brazil, the fact that our ecosystem um, of actors is so diverse. It involves NGOs, individuals, grassroots groups, political parties, and then uh, prosecutors that are uh, litigating on, on climate issues. So as I said, um, uh, this is very important to have this in mind, the, the concept of uh, geography of, of climate litigation, because 
um, we see that in Brazil, the main challenge for us is to reduce the emissions that are associated with land use change. And as you can see in the latest uh, data that has been released just this week, uh, Brazil's uh, emissions are 44% uh, associated with land use. And then if you add to that uh, the emissions coming from the agricultural sector, that means that more than 70% of our emissions are somehow associated with land. So it's not a surprise that the cases that we are seeing that are uh, that have been emerging in this last year, they are all related to land use and not to traditional issues like energy transition that is more common in developed countries. Um, you can also see how the uh, land use change is, is like the real challenge here. Um, the third columns, they represent the increase in the emissions coming from land use. And you can see that this is the major problem uh, for Brazil. Um, the other sectors that have also seen a slight increase, but um, the emissions coming from land use have actually um, exploded in, in recent years. So I bring to you, I present some uh, very like aggregated data. Um, oh, um, we are trying to map the cases that we have um, and to see what are the attributes of those cases. So these uh, statistics that I present here, they are based on this uh, mapping exercise. Um, and we're talking here uh, of a universe of around 54 cases. And this is updated until July. So we have had more cases coming um, in the past month. So uh, shortly, I will also be able to present an updated version of this of this mapping. So you can see here that uh, one um, the characteristic of Brazilian litigation is that it's more like indirect in the traditional classification of, of climate change. In, uh, it means that climate change uh, does not appear as the core or central aspect of, of, of the case, but rather as a peripheral aspect of those cases. Um, as I said, there is a, a, a diversity of the plaintiffs and also the respondents in, in, in this case, the defendants. So uh, the different sectors and the different entities, they are all bringing these cases to the judiciary and they're also, uh, but of course that we see like on the defendant side that uh, the government and, and uh, private enterprises, uh, they, uh, they tend to be more litigated and especially uh, the government so far. Then you can also see clearly that um, there is uh, an increase. So there is a, an upward tra trajectory in, in, since 2018 um, in terms of climate uh, litigation, with some uh, years where there has been a, a spike um, in, in climate litigation. But as I said, uh, in, 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 in past years, it was mostly indirect litigation. And then uh, most of these cases, they seek to advance climate ambition uh, with some, uh, a few cases at the state level that uh, are uh, like corporations seeking to uh, challenging uh, some, uh, some climate uh, laws and policies. So when we look uh, at uh, the stock of cases that we have in Brazil, it's, it's, it's possible to kind of classify or group them into different waves um, of cases. Um, the first wave of cases, which, is, uh, which are the cases that many people have written about, because until very recently, these were the cases that Brazil had. They are cases in which climate appears as a very, very indirect uh, issue. So we're talking about the classic case of the sugarcane burning and how it affects the climate system. But in those kinds of cases, you don't see any elaboration about climate laws, climate policies and obligations. Then we move to the second wave of, of, of cases where you can see uh, the parties uh, making more use and reference to climate laws, to climate agreements, but again, without uh, developing further what, uh, what kinds of, of concrete obligations and duties they impose on state and private actors. And then uh, we have seen now, I think we are on this third uh, wave of litigation in which uh, the parties, they uh, develop uh, climate arguments, they develop climate science, um, and they seek, uh, they, 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 I think the idea is that these uh, laws, this framework of climate uh, uh, laws, they actually uh, are the sources of concrete legal obligations. And I think that the next step um, uh, will be to uh, the fourth wave, which I think it's already started. But um, I think we're going to be entering like a, a new era of climate litigation once we have the first decisions coming from the courts 
that will make uh, explicit reference to uh, climate agreements and climate laws and build on those uh, legal sources to again impose some remedies and duties on state and non-state actors. In this like less uh, wave of, of litigation, we are seeing like recurrent themes that uh, appear in these cases. And these are the four uh, most common um, um, uh, themes that are being litigated. As I said before, there is a predominance of cases that are seeking to hold the government accountable for its failure to imp implement anti-deforestation uh, policies. Um, this is very much connected to the like broader issue of the dire situation of the climate uh, and environmental governance in Brazil. So the two things are interconnected by demonstrating that the Brazilian government is somehow weakening uh, the institutional uh, framework of climate policy in Brazil. These, the, the, the litigants, they seek to show that this is having a negative impact in the, uh, in, in, in the deforestation rates and other uh, sorts of indicators um, about uh, climate and, and environmental policy. Um, there are some cases, as many of you might have heard, uh, that discuss one specific component of this broader climate framework, which is uh, the climate finance instrument. So two cases that are seeking to restore uh, the climate fund and the Amazon fund, which are basically the two main sources of climate finance in Brazil and these two funds uh, they have been stalled. So the idea is that they uh, resume the disbursements. And also there's a problem with participation of civil society in the decision-making processes. Um, and um, there are a uh, few cases, which I'm not gonna be discussing here, uh, that uh, discuss the energy transition. You, you see this, especially at the state level, some uh, subnational uh, actors, they have been uh, implementing some, some policies that would drive like uh, the economy towards a low carbon economy. But then sometimes these policies, they tend to face uh, some legal challenges from the corporate uh, sector. Um, again, um, as I said, since we will be focusing on the uh, first two issues, it's always good to bring back the fact that Brazil now is seeing a, a, a huge increase in the deforestation rates. Uh, the levels of deforestation that uh, we've been having in the last two years, they are only compared to what we used to have 10 years or 20 years ago. So Brazil was very successful between 2004 and 2012 to uh, achieve an 80% decrease in deforestation. And because of that, uh, Brazil felt that um, we could commit to stronger um, um, uh, commitments um, in, in even before the Paris Agreement, when Brazil submitted um, its nationally uh, appropriated mitigated, mitigation action in, uh, in Copenhagen. And we committed internationally to have an 80% deforestation until this uh, exact year, 2020. And then that commitment was translated, um, internalized as, as, as binding legislation in Brazil as well. And what we see right now is that we are deviating from this commitment. And by 2020, there is an expectation that we're gonna have um, another 30% increase in deforestation rate. So um, Francesco, how much time do I have left? Just I have another five minutes. So please take your time. If you want to use a wee bit more, that's fine. Great, no, thank you very much. So I, I, I think this is a, a panel, like a chart of the seven, I think, most important cases. And I think they also somehow, uh, these seven cases, they provide a, a very good picture of what is being litigated. And again, this is a selection of cases that uh, deal with land use um, and, 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 and deforestation. Uh, we have other sorts of cases. Um, let me quickly just go through uh, each of these cases, just for everyone to have an idea of how diverse and how rich um, the, the climate litigation landscape is, is right now in Brazil, uh, both in terms of the issues that are being litigated and also in terms of the actors that are bringing these cases. So the first case uh, from the Brazilian Environmental uh, Federal Agency, it basically it challenges um, 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 uh, uh, a steel uh, company uh, because this steel company has failed to carry out due diligence in its supply chain to avoid using uh, charcoal that has been sourced in areas that have been uh, illegally deforested. So this is a very important case because it, it develops some uh, new concepts that uh, uh, I think it's the first time that they appear in, in the courts in Brazil. Like for instance, what does it mean 
to have a climate damage. So as, as Patricia said, Brazilian law uh, has a very uh, sophisticated framework in terms of what it means, uh, the environmental damage and who is the polluter. And I think this case is important because it seeks to extend those concepts to who is a polluter in terms of climate uh, damages. So uh, this is one case that uh, we all should watch. Um, the two cases, the, the second and the third, both of them have been brought by the federal prosecutors. One, uh, the first case challenges uh, a measure by the Bolsonaro government that abolished um, uh, um, um, a policy that restricted uh, biofuel plantation in the Amazon. And the first decision, it basically said that without technical evidence, without technical studies, the government cannot uh, change uh, its policy that was more protective to the environment. Then the third case also by the federal prosecutors, it's discussing the uh, weakening of the uh, inspections um, and the fiscalization of the federal agencies in the context of the pandemic. So we have seen since March that there has been like an aggravation of this scenario of absence of the state in the Amazon. And this case seeks to uh, compel the government to be more active in some of the critical areas where deforestation is happening. Then you have also the fourth case brought by a coalition of prosecutors and NGOs uh, that is challenging the government on a measure that would ease the requirements for export of timber. Um, these, these, uh, the plaintiffs, they, they argue that this would stimulate illegal deforestation. And then um, we have another case, the fifth case, which is uh, the government sought to also weaken the protection of the Atlantic. So we often talk about the Amazon because it's a very important biome, but also other protected biomes like the Atlantic forest, it's also under attack. So this fifth case was challenging uh, the government uh, approach to this specific biome. Um, and then we have uh, these two, um, I, I didn't put here, I'm sorry, the, the two cases, I think it was in another slide uh, and I, I didn't copy, but of course that you have the two at uh, the Amazon case, the Amazon fund and the climate fund cases, both of them challenging the government because of its failure to uh, implement uh, or, or to disburse the funds that, this, uh, that, that, that exist already out there. And you see that in these cases there have been public hearings but I think it's important now to highlight the last two cases that have been just recently filed in this past two weeks. The seventh actually was filed just the day before yesterday. And these cases, they are, are seeking to hold the government accountable for the failure to implement the key instrument in deforestation control in Brazil, in Brazil, which is the action plan for the prevention and control of deforestation. It's a very sophisticated public policy that was implemented in 2004. And it's basically been abandoned by the government since last year. And this, these entities, they basically, they associate the implementation of this plan with the results that Brazil achieved some years ago in drastically reducing deforestation. And uh, the first case was brought before the lower courts of the federal justice. And the second case by a coalition of 17 NGOs and political parties has been filed directly before the Supreme Court. And these cases, uh, they have lots of overlaps, but they are highly complementary to each other. The case brought before the lower court, it develops quite well, in my opinion, um, that the Brazilian targets, because we have a national uh, uh, climate change policy, that this policy is not just an aspirational policy, but it's a legally enforceable policy. So it does a really good job in making that case. And the, the second case, it makes a, a very good a kind of uh, an anatomy of this, what we call the dismantlement of the environmental policy in Brazil. So it basically summarizes it in very detail what kind of normative rollbacks, the actions and inactions from the government that are giving the cause to the situation where we are right now. So my last slide is what everyone should be watching in terms of, of, of the, the, the climate cases in Brazil. Um, I think there are three important things to watch. First, what will be the role of science and the expert evidence that has been presented, especially these two last cases, they have 
presented to the court the state of the art in climate uh, science, uh, all this relationship between the importance of the Amazon uh, for climate instability at the local, regional and, and, and global level. Also with a very compelling evidence about uh, how destabilization and a breakdown in the Amazon would have spillover effects in other uh, ecosystems like the Arctic, for instance, using the concepts of feedback loops and tipping points. Then I think a very important thing to watch, because I know this, is, has, this has been a main hurdle in other cases, is how enforceable uh, national and international climate targets will be. So if the courts in Brazil decide that um, an international commitment or a commitment that has been translated into national policy is enforceable, is legally binding upon the government, this will be, I think, a major milestone in, in, in actually making uh, these uh, national and international frameworks more effective. And finally, I'm also very personally interested in learning, in, in, in seeing what the courts will deliver in terms of concrete remedies. I think that this, this last case that was filed the day before yesterday makes a, also a very good point in, uh, in, in, in seeking structural remedies. So the, 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 the request in this case is that the court orders the government to establish a, a plan, but merely a plan won't be sufficient. So this plan will need to have uh, concrete detailed targets, indicators, time frame. The implementation of these plans should be, should be transparent. So they require the government to create a dedicated website that everyone can access to understand how government is making progress. And another ask is that the government, that the court establish an independent commission composed by multi stakeholders, including the scientific communities that would monitor the implementation of this plan and report back to the court. So I think that's it, Francesco. I'm ready here to take um, uh, questions and answers. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much, Caio. That was absolutely stellar. And uh, it, it really showed what I think you started it, this rich ecosystem of actors involved in climate mitigation. It's just uh, uh, staggering, not just the amount of cases, but the different, the different layers, the different perspectives that are coming out from these cases. And uh, I, I wasn't joking when I said that the developments are coming literally in the last few days, as you just heard from Kaya. So Kaya took us through this journey around uh, developments that are happening in climate mitigation in Brazil. I now give the floor to Joana, to Joana Setzer, who will build on this presentation, but also expand a little bit on her own experience and the work she has done uh, on potentially even cases outside of Brazil and some trends and so forth. But I'll let it, uh, I'll give Joanna the floor. And uh, I do encourage, there was a lot to take in from Kaya's presentation, but if somebody does have questions, please use the Q&A box and together with my collaborators, with my team, I will filter them. And once we finish Joanna's presentation, we will have plenty of time until 4.30 Glasgow time to have a really interesting, vibrant and uh, enjoyable discussion. Joanna, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you so much, Francesco. And thank you, everyone. I have to say, uh, we, of course, we have so many webinars these days and you think, oh, OK, one more. But you know, like exactly what we're having today, it's the kind of webinar that I think you really feel you, you've learned because you get the the from Patricia, okay, what is the legal system there? Then from Caio, you get uh, everything that is happening and from the broad analysis to the specific cases and the excitement of the last months. And uh, it's, it, it, I really find this useful. So from, from my side, as Francesco said, what I want to do is a bit bring the two together. So the, what's happening in Brazil, one particular case that uh, Caio didn't have so much time to talk about, but uh, is this, uh, the case that was uh, recently heard at the Supreme Court. And then I want to open uh, wide again and, 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 and bring a few considerations about how this matters in terms of broader climate governance even. You know, be, uh, it matters for climate litigation, it matters for broader climate uh, uh, governance. Um, so that's my plan in my 10 minutes. Uh, in, in terms of uh, what's happening in Brazil, what you said in, and Kai, you said, uh, Francesco, uh, about the rich ecosystem, it, it really shows how uh, the rich ecosystem of the Amazon and the rainforest and uh, so many other biodiversity uh, that we have in Brazil is reflecting now in, in litigation. Uh, we went from 
decades of not having much going on to a last year where so much is happening. Caio and I wrote an article that we started writing, I can't remember Caio when it was, not long ago, and, and basically the, the argument of the, the paper was, yes, we have all the, as Patricia said, all, all the legislation to bring cases, but there's not much going on. And then in the meantime, between finishing the paper, submitting and getting it published, Oof, the whole thing <laughs> went uh, and proved exactly that point, but it, it's really um, showing how Brazil not only can be, but I think has already become uh, an important battleground for climate litigation. And maybe we'll get to that point uh, that Caio raised of how the lessons from these cases, I think there are already some lessons. Uh, they are relevant for wider litigation. Climate litigation is one of those typical transnational environmental law um, uh, topics, and, and there's a lot to learn. So I also want to emphasize a few of these points in my presentation. So I start from the specific case, the uh, Patricia said ADPF, so one more uh, acronym, basically it stands for act, a type of action for non-compliance with a fundamental uh, a constitutional uh, requirement. And, and, and this was uh, a lawsuit that was filed earlier this year uh, by political parties directly to the Supreme Court, which is already in itself interesting. First, that political parties can file lawsuits. Second, that this lawsuit goes directly to the Supreme Court. And then there are many interesting aspects of this lawsuit. On, on one hand, it's a very simple case. Uh, basically, there is this climate fund that was created in 2009 that aims at financing adaptation and mitigation action. Um, interesting, the, the fund uses resources from uh, oil extraction, so there's a, a certain percentage that goes into this fund and the fund then should uh, be supporting projects on adaptation and mitigation. Very well, the government, the new government uh, basically uh, dismantled the fund in terms of uh, the, the government, the governance bodies of the fund, and also uh, it was not disembarrassing uh, anymore since uh, the beginning of last year. So th the lawsuit in this regard is very simple. It just says, look, Supreme Court, uh, there is this fund. It's it's an important uh, fund, and it's been paralyzed. And, and this, this shows an in unconstitutional omission. Can you please recognize that and make the fund uh, start uh, disembarrassing again? So it's not a, an agenda case that says, government, you have to be more ambitious. It's not you know, a, 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 a de justicia case that tries to recognize the rights of the forest. It's a very simple case, and I like that because I think for a first case that reaches the Supreme Court, maybe this is where you had a chance of winning. You know, it, it's the, the case still is ongoing, hasn't been decided, but it is simple enough to allow for maybe a, a success. And at the same time, the, the, the uh, justice that received the case expanded its scope and said uh, he really wanted to understand uh, how the, uh, the wider uh, issues on environmental governance. So it expanded and it allowed for to understand that there, it's not just about this, the fund that is paralyzed, there's more uh, things that are paralyzed there. So um, the, um, the idea of the, the, the case is that, well, the Brazil uh, has a number of uh, commitments made towards Paris and, and, and these won't be uh, achieved if, for example, there's no uh, funding of adaptation and mitigation measures. And this violates Article 225 of the constitution, which uh, establishes the duty uh, of the state to protect the environment. Very well, so the case is filed. And then there's this really interesting uh, moment where the Supreme Court decides to hold a public hearing in the Supreme Court. And uh, the, just when the, the, the public hearing was called, the justification was that they wanted an objective and official account of the state of environmental policy in Brazil. And, and, and of course, for everyone who follows what's going on in Brazil, having something objective is really uh, important now where you have uh, really a polarized society with uh, the government often 
challenging even the science of climate change and the data that is produced in terms of deforestation and a lawsuit like that. So uh, the idea in itself to hold this public hearing was uh, very um, timely and representative, I think, of the moment of the, that the country is going through. And then, uh, of course, ultimately, the uh, objective is to investigate the, this, the potentially harmful inaction of the government. So um, this uh, public hearing takes place and the uh, Supreme Court invites 66 people, uh, individuals, uh, representing different organizations. And these are scientists, environmentalists, so as some uh, uh, NGO people, indigenous people, uh, people representing agribusiness and the financial sectors. So the president of the largest bank in Brazil. Um, also researchers and academics, parliamentarians and representatives from the federal government and uh, subnational governments. It's really all of society and they selected really key people who could speak about from all possible angles. Uh, not only that, but the public hearing was broadcasted live and also um, made available on the website of the Supreme Court, which is, uh, of course, something that is now more common with uh, COVID and remote hearings, but you really see how this opens the debate, not only the, the Supreme Court was listening to that, but anyone can listen to that. Um, and, and again, it's the first time a climate case reaches the Supreme Court. So what a, is there any better way of doing it than setting this ground, which is very pl plural and, and, and really getting information that goes beyond what has been submitted. So uh, in terms of what this case represents, I think there are four firsts that it represents. So it's the first climate change litigation to reach the Supreme Court. And now we have a few others uh, in the past week. <laughs> uh, second is the first climate litigation brought by political parties. There was a connected case challenging the, uh, 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 the Amazon fund that was filed at the same time, but uh, comparing to climate litigation worldwide, we hadn't seen this before. Uh, third is the first climate litigation case to address uh, insufficient action in finance. So not only in adopting mitigation measures, but in financing those. And lastly, it's the first climate case uh, where the Supreme Court holds a, a public hearing like that. So already in terms of the lessons, I think that just the hearing already has a number of lessons for, for other courts. And, and mind, it's not just litigants that want to learn with each other in, in climate litigation, the judges are learning from each other. There are a bunch of judges there in networks of judges that are studying the cases and they speak to each other. So there is potential for learning across judges. So I want to finish my, uh, my presentation just uh, raising two points in what this, uh, this represents in terms of wider governance. So climate litigation as a governance tool, uh, really this, this case and a number of other cases shows the, diverse, uh, the diversity of actors involved. So you know, just the example of the 66 experts, and I, I had the, the chance of being one of those, which was a real privilege. Um, so it, how it when we talk, define clim, um, climate governance, we talk about multi-level actors, multi-level uh, across scales and across actors. That's exactly the definition of it, and um, and how it's really trying to to promote action uh, using the state uh, mechanisms. And, and, and this is where there is a hurdle, which is the point that actually I addressed there, which is a, maybe an apparent one, but one that is constantly brought, which is the issue of separation of powers. Is this a problem or not? So I'm happy to speak more about this in the Q&As. Um, but the way the court defined climate change as one of the most defining questions of our time, there you go, you have the courts recognizing that. That's already really important. Uh, thanks, Francesco. And um, and that's uh, the, the reason to do such a hearing is that climate change transcends legal matters. Yes, 
it's not a problem. It doesn't mean that the political question paralyzes a judge of deciding. It just means that the judge needs to get informed. It doesn't mean that they cannot decide. So I think that's it's another really uh, important point. And then just to finish, uh, I think in terms of the specific uh, roles of the court, it shows uh, two things. First, how courts can help searching the facts. And uh, Minister Bahoz, when he finished his uh, the, the public hearings, this is what he said. He said, look, I want to know what's the truth. I know science has uncertainties, but this hearing was made to search for facts in a context where everyone is, you know, where the government says the, the earth is flat. So it's important to check, to do a fact check. A check. So how courts can uh, search for facts. And lastly, what Caio said in terms of the remedies, I think that's uh, also something for, for courts to first to think about what is the role of courts. And then for that, litigants need to think very carefully about what they're asking. So yes, targets, yes, a time frame, yes, transparency. But I wanted to add one point to what Caio said that I think it's also important to keep in mind is the issue of just transitions. So you have to, when you bring this case and when you decide a case like this, uh, have in mind that there are many uh, groups and sectors that might be affected. And those bringing the case, I, we learned that in Urgenda, can maybe also help seeing and presenting ideas of how uh, by, for, for example, stopping uh, coal or reducing deforestation, which is a mean of uh, living for many, you can replace that with other means that allows for uh, livelihoods and development. And, and I think there is a role for litigation and remedies also in there. So I finished there and um, I'm looking forward uh, to a discussion Q&A. Thank you, Francesco and everyone. Thank you very, very much, Joanna. That was uh... Uh, absolutely fascinating. Before I open it to the questions, and I see already some very interesting ones in the Q&A, which actually build on some of the points that Joanna has just mentioned as well, let me make two general observations that do not require an answer from the speakers because I do want to give more time to the audience and the participants. The first one, Joanna hinted to it, and I think it's an important one. There is a cross-fertilization happening with climate litigation. To be honest, it's not just about climate litigation. We, we, we have seen this in other areas as well. But in climate litigation, you are seeing, as you said, judges talking to each other, learning about what has happened in one country to the other. But not only judges, also plaintiffs. There's a lot of learning and a lot of exchange. But Having said that, and this builds on what um, one of the points that Kayo mentioned, if I understood correctly, one of the remedies that has been asked or that is coming out from some of these cases is the, ju the judiciary to some extent uh, providing or suggesting, and do correct me if I got this wrong, uh, a strategy a plan. And I say this because I have seen this also in other cases, not just climate related, for example, in Colombia, when it comes to the Atrato River case, to the, to the Amazon case also in, in Colombia. So what I'm trying to say here is that uh, I do wonder whether these kind of remedies, this kind of uh, suggesting the way forward without entering into the exact uh, know how to do it because obviously it's not for the judiciary to say that is this something that transcends the the boundaries of the amazon in brazil and is actually more at least some parts of latin america i don't want to put all latin america together because there's a lot of diversity in latin america but it is coming from some parts of latin america and i say this because although it's great to see examples from New Zealand, from Pakistan, from the Urgenda case, from Greenpeace now happening in Norway, and so forth, we also have to be very careful that a lot of this litigation is context specific. And that why is I think that Patricia's presentation at the beginning was very important to provide the necessary context to the procedures and to the possibilities in the Brazilian legal system and judiciary. But I just wanted to raise that as two points. And I would like to start the questions 
with those that were posed by Ana Claudia Franco and Juana Uzi. If, uh, if you see the question from Ana Claudia Franco, she has a question for all speakers. So I will ask all of you to address this. And it is, do you think that the Brazilian Supreme Court is technically prepared to face these cases? And I think Juan Aru's case is also, is also related to this to some extent, because he does have a question concerning the overall trust in the judiciary in Brazil. And he, as I, uh, is broadening the question to the whole of Latin America. Um, he says that there's a perception, and this is Juan Aru speaking, at the Latin American level that the independence of the judiciary is being eroded by the influence of the executive, especially in countries that economically depend on the extraction of natural resources. Is the independence of the judiciary a concern in Brazil or plaintiffs taking this into account when strategizing legal actions? And then he finishes by saying how insulative are courts from the clause of the executive. So I will start with Patricia, our first speaker comments on how the Brazilian Supreme Court is addressing this. And I would ask you, Patricia, because obviously in your day-to-day -day work, you obviously deal with courts at all levels, not just the Brazilian Supreme Court. So I do wonder, you know, even at the lower levels, what do you think, inter if there's a climate case coming to the courts, or even, you know, through you as a practitioner, uh, do you think the, the legal profession in Brazil, is it ready for this? As Caio said, there's almost a wave now happening. And then I'll move to the same question to Joanna and Caio. Sure, thank you. From my experience, uh, I'm not sure if, if Caio and Joanna will agree, but in general, I think that the judiciary is very, very independent from the executive. Um, this is not to say that the ju judiciary is completely free from any pressure. We see a lot of uh, public pressure, be it in the Supreme Court, uh, the pressure of public opinion, be it in the Supreme Court or on lower levels. But I think, for example, this climate uh, fund cases with Justice Barroso, uh, I think that the, the justices in the Supreme Court are very well equipped to deal with these issues. They are very independent, in my opinion. And uh, when they are not so well equipped in terms of expertise, they open uh, the discussion to all of these actors, which Joana mentioned in these public hearings. So I think that there is hope in the judiciary. We should not uh, believe that these cases uh, uh, are, are hopeless in any way. And I think that also a factor that really uh, goes into this is that recently with the corruption scandals in Brazil and Lava Jato, the Supreme Court, we feel that, I don't know, Brazilians now know the names of the justices of the Supreme Court like they know the soccer players. And this 10 years ago, 20 years ago would be unheard of. So I think that this spotlight on the judiciary, on the, on the members of the Supreme Court also uh, enhances this independence. Uh, we see all the time the, the justices of the Supreme Court fighting even publicly with President Bolsonaro. So I think that both of all of these factors contribute to each uh, uh, every year a more independent and more confident judiciary. Thank you. Thank you, Patricia. Caio, do you want to comment on these questions from Juan Aruz and Ana Claudio Franco? Well, I, I think that these two questions are somehow um, interrelated. Um, the, 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 the question, the point that you've made about the outcome of this case, it somehow uh, um, is related to the legitimacy of the court. So, um, of course, that every, and we, we have this, uh, I mean, many studies show how the, the judiciary seek to have legitimacy um, uh, based on the reasoning of their um, of their um, decisions, yes. So this would not be different with, um, in, with regards to this case. I mean, these are cases that they are built on the uh, on the on the issue that Brazil is seeing like an unprecedented collapse of its environmental governance, and I think that the facts, as Joanna said, they have been made quite clear and. Even the like the very little um, interventions um, that the, the justices made during the two public hearings of the Amazon Fund case and the Amazon and the Climate Fund case, 
there, there was like um, um, a demonstration that they tend to see, they are seeing a mismatch between what the government is saying um, and what the facts are saying and all, what all the independent institutions and even the governmental institutions are, are, are somehow uh, reporting to the court. So I think it's pretty clear right now for the court that um, the what the government says is not exactly what is happening in the real world. But does this mean that the court will have like unlimited uh, uh, um, uh, power to uh, rule on these cases? And I don't think so. So I think this fine balance, you know, between what is needed from the court, from the judiciary at this point in Brazil, where the avenues of dialogue between the government and society are have been shut and what the court can effectively do is actually like the one million dollar question that uh, we're gonna have to see and i agree with you francesco that um, and with joanna that it's, it's not just enough to have a plan or a commission we have been seeing this in pakistan and in colombia and we see the hurdles and obstacles that these kinds of of, of rulings they have so, but I think that um, it's now the time to test uh, a little, some, some kind of innovations in how we do, uh, we how, in how the institutional governance of these decisions will happen. And Brazil has a tradition of, of um, structural uh, litigation. This is something that appeared in Colombia uh, some uh, decades ago. And, and there, there has been like a landmark case in Brazil about the prison system. So the prison system uh, has also, is also facing in Brazil for a long time a situation of complete collapse. And we see like massive human rights violations in the prison system. So now what the litigants are seeking to do is to uh, somehow translate these doctrines and this approach to the environment. And what we see is that the, why they are doing this, because this opens up a little bit more of kind of margin of maneuver for the court to step in. And I personally think that this is the situation. We are, we are seeing like a critical situation. It's not, it's not just like a normal um, failure or like something that is like day-to-day -day litigation. It's like a litigation that brings like structural issues. So I think that somehow society will feel that it will be legitimate this time for the court to take some more drastic measures than we would kind of accept um, in a normal situation. Thank you very much, Caio. I will ask Joanna if you have something more to add to what Patricia and Caio said, and then I'll move to some more questions. I'll be very short because I think they've already uh, addressed very well. Also, you know, they are in Brazil, so they are much uh, more entitled to, to talk about these things than me. I've been away for some time. But I think in terms of the uh, Juan's question, uh, it, it's I agree with Patricia that there is still uh, hope, and I think with good reasons that there is independence in the judiciary. Uh, of course, no judiciary, no person is apolitical. So uh, it doesn't mean that being independent is not being political. And the Supreme Court is, of course, very political. You know, the, the, the Supreme Court justices are appointed by the president. So they are, uh, even if you want to question it, you cannot because it, it begins very much by a political appointment. Uh, but at the same time, I think in, in these last years of really difficult social, political and economic crisis in Brazil, uh, the judiciary has been standing. It has been uh, a port of hope. Uh, what Patricia said about people knowing the, the names of the Supreme Court justices, I, I feel the same. My grandmother now goes on and on about oh, each one of the Supreme Court justices. She knows all of them by name. It, we're becoming a bit like the US where this, you know, it's something people know about. And um, that is anecdotal, but it shows that there, the, the fact that there is hope there also justifies, I think, this movement of climate education. And I think my last point is, we, we always say this, you know, again and again, everyone who works on litigation, that litigation is not what we want. We, we would rather not be litigating. No, I've been a litigator. I, I, I stopped being because I, I couldn't bear anymore the, the thought of how much time and energy goes into that and how long it takes for any decision. And what you were saying that even once you have the decision, you don't know where this decision, uh, where, where it's going, if it's going to change anything. So litigation is clearly not uh, the 
first is probably the last uh, resource, but uh, we, we got to a point in the general context of the country where I think that became important is the combination of the urgency of the matter. So yes, climate and yes, uh, the dismantling. And second, where so many other structures have been dismantled. So the combination of the two, I think, led to courts being really uh, an important place to go. And, and, and let's see what will happen with these cases. But I, I feel that while I generally don't support litigation, it was the right time to do it. And, and I'm pleased to see how this is going because it's also been very inclusive in terms of the, those bringing the cases and, and those participating. Thank you very much, Joanna. We still have 20 minutes and we have a lot of incredibly interesting questions. I am trying to cluster them in a certain order. Uh, I, I will also ask our speakers to try to answer them uh, uh, briefly so that we can get even more uh, questions and answers and really have a rich debate. The first one is very much about who can bring the cases. So this comes from Senan, from Senan Matar, and there's a related question also from, 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 from Utkarsh Jain. Senan asks, in terms of procedural justice, how well do you think those most vulnerable to climate change in Brazil are able to engage in litigation to protect the environment. And I bring also uh, the question from Utkarsh because I do think it's related. He says, what role do you see local executive quasi-judicial authorities playing in climate litigation? But the big question for me is for a lot of people, Supreme Courts are too far, too expensive. And before I give the floor to one of the three of you who may want to volunteer to answer this question, this is a problem not only potentially in Brazil, obviously, it's for you to answer if that is a problem in Brazil, but even in the UK, for example, uh, bringing a climate case, any case in the United Kingdom is very expensive and in many other parts of the world. So that is definitely a barrier. Who can bring these, uh, these cases? So I don't know if there's anybody in particular who would like to answer. Do I have a volunteer for this question? Maybe, maybe, I don't know, Patricia, do you want to go with this one? I can, I can start uh, just about the costs. Uh, I'm not sure exactly the numbers for, for uh, filing a AG or a DPF or, or a DI, but what I can say uh, with respect to the United States is, is that litigation in Brazil is very cheap, very. The, the, the state subsidizes litigation. So something that we see on a daily basis, which is not of course the case of any of the cases that we mentioned here, but something that we see on a daily basis is very unfounded claims because it is so cheap to litigate. So I think that that wouldn't be uh, an obstacle here in Brazil because the state subsidizes these claims. So for example, uh, I could have just a civil suit, I could have like a 200 million uh, uh, reais suit and I would pay something like 39,000 reais, which is the legal limit here in Rio, for example, the courts of Rio. The, 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 federal, the federal courts in Brasilia, I think, are a bit more expensive, but nothing that would uh, stop these uh, legitimate entities from, from filing suits. I, I, I don't think this is an obstacle. And can I maybe just ask, and maybe Kayo can answer here, because one thing is the money. One thing is for a vulnerable group to have links to the people who have the capacity to bring these cases. So I wondered, Caio, whether you can explain, especially to those in the audience who are not from Brazil, whether you feel that those who are suffering the most are act do have all the possible tools to bring their plight, their, their request before the courts. Yeah, well, um, I, I agree with Patricia that some of the uh, barriers for access to justice that we see elsewhere, like uh, especially like procedural issues like standing and uh, the representation of one, uh, like an, uh, someone being represented by an organization. Uh, so I think Brazil's uh, uh, law is quite generous in terms of um, um, an association being able to act on behalf of 
uh, a community, for instance, without having to show, for instance, that there has been uh, a particularized injury or some of those things that we see in, in, in other jurisdictions, especially in the common law. So I think that this somehow um, is, is um, um, facilitates the, the lawsuits. I think the problem as uh, other developing uh, countries is like structural uh, barriers to access to justice. Yes, so uh, the asymmetry of power between the communities and those who are causing the harm, um, lack of knowledge about the existence of those rights, um, like you know literacy. literacy. I mean, so um, the the one thing that kind of balances uh, this 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 like structural uh, situation is that we have a very, very good um, institution with, uh, who are the public prosecutors. And we also have the public defenders. The difference between the two of them is that the public defenders, they provide like individual legal assistance, whereas the public prosecutors, they kind of file um, lawsuits on the, on, on, on the collective interest. So these are like highly trained lawyers, civil servants. Um, they uh, are able to represent those communities and they have been doing so a lot. So we see this and in some of these cases that I mentioned, like the case in the critical areas in the Amazon was exactly the public prosecutors mm -hmm. acting on behalf of the indigenous peoples uh, to try to uh, contain the, the, the pandemic from reaching the indigenous people's territories. So I think this is one of the uh, things that perhaps make things a little bit more democratic here. Okay, uh, let me go to a question which again focuses on who are the actors, this rich ecosystem. And one of the participants, Nick Cross, uh, adds to this rich ecosystem another potential actor. And this is, can international NGOs play any role in domestic litigation in Brazil? So I just ask this part of the question. I, I know for a fact that not just in Brazil, but in also in other Latin American countries, actually the local NGOs are really active and have a huge amount of capacity in some cases. So I'm quite curious to know, again, uh, I may ask this to Caio and then I'll move to the other speakers for other questions. Uh, are you aware if there are international NGOs involved in these cases? Do you think that could, should happen? I think so far the, the what we've been seeing is a very like uh, local yes mobilization. What we I think it's important and I think it's desperately needed. And fortunately, we've seen some initiatives just like this one, but also the climate acceleration uh, hub um, uh, of the NYU is to have this kind of cross fertilization and information sharing and experience sharing. Uh, between litigants in all other parts of the world. Um, uh, I think also we can strengthen the Latin American network of climate litigation. And I think some organizations are taking care of this to try to build, build these dialogue platforms. I, I think this is very important uh, because again, this, of course that we have similarities, but it's so different to litigate in Brazil than from litigating the UK or Australia um, and the US. So I think that uh, we can build this uh, coalition of, of organizations that are litigating in, in, in specific regions. But let me just say, Francisco, I think there's a question about the uh, private sector. And I think this is where perhaps a cross uh, national collaboration between NGOs could be very, very interesting. Because as you can see, we got quite well covered the government. So of course there is much to do and let's see the outcomes of these cases and the battles. But of course that the private sector has its own responsibility and I think they need to be held accountable if they are not taking the necessary steps like carrying out due diligence to avoid being linked to deforestation and etc. And I think this is where perhaps national and international NGOs could work together to see like if in the home jurisdiction of, the, of some of these companies, they can also seek some kind of redress. And that's where I think that uh, we can see very uh, good potential. An interesting point. Uh, let's but move to one, a question. One tiny point, sorry, in addition to what happens said, after. Um, yes, Joanna. Yeah, just that, for example, this last lawsuit filed two days ago, uh, Greenpeace is one uh, of the petitioners too. So there, there are local organizations. I don't know if that this was also part of the question, but of course, there's a even I think a strategic decision to make uh, to have. Uh, Brazilian NGOs up front because you don't want to be attacked by uh, this is you know some uh, there is a lot of uh, attack on <laughs> international NGOs now going on in Brazil so I think there's uh, you don't want to give margin for 
that, but nevertheless, for example, Greenpeace, and I don't know if others, Caillou, but uh, Greenpeace is one of those uh, uh, supporting the case uh, filed two, two, two days ago. So mm -hmm. sometimes just to say it, it, it might be strategic to, uh, to not uh, make them upfront, but there is a, definitely a lot of support uh, on backstage that is needed and that is taking place. Okay. Uh, questions are coming in really fast, super interesting. So we'll really have to try. To, I'll, I'll try to share them equally with, uh, with the speakers with uh, as much as possible, very short answers so we can get as many as possible in. Uh, the next one I want to touch is uh, from Carolina Garrido. And I asked Carolina's question because it talks about what happens once the decision is made. And she asked, I would like to know what the speakers think will be the main challenges to implement an eventual favorable decision in these cases against the government. So I hope, Joanna, if you don't mind, if I ask you to answer this question. I would like to know what the speakers think will be the main challenges to implement an eventual favorable decision in these cases against the government. Okay, yeah, good. And I was distracted because I, I just read uh, Kristen's Casper's. I didn't realize she was uh, here uh, clarifying. Thanks that uh, Greenpeace Brazil is independent from uh, Greenpeace International. So, um, um, yeah, she made this clarification. Thanks, Kristen. Um, and in terms of the implementation, uh, as I said, for example, with the uh, climate fund case, that that should, shouldn't be a uh, too hard to implement. Uh, you can easily see how uh, the fund is giving money or it's not giving money. Uh, and of course, then you can follow up with the question of, is it giving money to the right initiatives? Uh, and, and by populating the, um, the, uh, the, the governance body with people from government that might shift the priorities. So it, depending on how deep you go into this question, even uh, uh, an easy answer to yes, it is easy to implement gets complicated. But uh, overall, I think it's it's back to uh, what um, Caillou said in terms of the remedies and how it is important that uh, those involved in litigation know that uh, filing the case and eventually winning the case is not the end of the story. So of course, everyone wants the champagne photo, you know, the agenda photo, everyone holding hands we won, this is what everyone aims. But first, winning doesn't mean in practice. And also you see how sometimes not winning also has uh, some wins in, in, in itself. So you can see how uh, by bringing these cases against corporates, particularly the cases against the financial sector, they might not necessarily win or they are still ongoing, but you already see how uh, financial regulators, for example, here, here in the UK and in Australia and in New Zealand, they are already changing behavior and changing regulation just based on cases that have been filed. So there's changing behavior in the meantime. Okay, so we're getting close to the end. So I think we're gonna have another round of questions. There's so many interesting ones. What I think what we'll definitely do is uh, I will share all these questions with the speakers after the webinar and hopefully they can also reach out to you. So I, I'd like to move now to a set of questions which look, which look um, also at international law, international environmental law uh, in the context of this Brazilian uh, developments and litigation. The first question comes from uh, Saverio Di Benedetto at the University of Lecce in Italy. And Saverio asks uh, about the relevance of the Biodiversity Convention in the Brazilian cases. Are these references to biodiversity protection present in the Amazon Fund case? And I just bring two more questions that are related to international law because we then have a question from Mariana Polshakova, who focuses on the Paris Agreement. So the first one is about the Biodiversity Convention. The second one is about the Paris Agreement. And her question is, what is the likelihood, based on the tradition of education and progress in the cases so far, so again, all the seven and more cases that Caio mentioned, that the court will pronounce in the legal nature of international commitments and their enforceability? The last question that relates to international uh, law comes from Christina Voigt, University of Oslo, and she's asking about, well, what about the Inter-American Court of Human Rights? 
uh, yes, this is about domestic litigation, but she's asking, what are your thoughts about the prospect of international litigation versus Brazil, for example, at the Inter-American Court of Human Rights? So maybe starting with Patricia with this last question uh, about uh, individuals in Brazil bringing the government to the Inter-American Court of Human Rights for similar climate litigation cases. Do you think this may or may not happen? And then we'll move to the CBD and the Paris Agreement. Patricia. Um, this is not exactly my area of expertise, but I, I can see it happen. I think that the, the more that these issues gain prominence uh, at a national level, then Brazilians will start to, to demand and, and to question these, these acts at an international level as well. Um, I think Joana and Caio are, are a little bit more experienced with this international level, but I don't see any obstacle in, in enhancing and increasing this litigation at an international level as well. I, I will ask Caio to comment potentially on the biodiversity question, the Convention on Biological Diversity, but if you want to also add any points on the Inter-American Court of Human Rights, feel free to do so, and then I'll ask Joana to comment on the Paris Agreement. Caio. No, um, uh, some of these cases, they have also um, featured biodiversity issues. And again, the case by Greenpeace Brazil and others, uh, they also make the point that the destruction uh, of the Amazon will not only have a detrimental impact in this, uh, the, the stability of the climate system, but also that will represent, uh, of course, um, uh, a huge um, impact uh, to the biodiversity in Brazil, uh, we often say it's the most biodiverse uh, country in the world, but I, I see, I, 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 I don't see yet this biodiversity being litigated with this focus that we are seeing right now um, on climate uh, change. One thing that is important to notice is that the traditional biodiversity litigation in Brazil is more around the protected territories than to endangered species. So by litigating, for instance, on, on the protection of conservation units as the lawsuit, this last lawsuit is doing, or the indigenous people's territories, I think automatically, somehow these cases are advancing biodiversity goals. Um, and then let me just uh, uh, bring back this, this issue about who's involved, because somehow sometimes, and again, we, we are in a, a government that loves conspiracy theories um, about you know, international NGOs or a government being interested in the Amazon. And this was, uh, this was discussed in one of the hearings a minister like the, the, the national security uh, representative, he said that, and it was really interesting to see how the, the, the Supreme Court didn't buy at all this argument and, and clearly responded by saying that we are looking for facts, not by parallel realities. So I think that, I mean, as a civil society, we should not, I mean, of course that we uh, should uh, do the best strategy, but we should not be fearful of, you know, the potential of transnational networks to bring cases. And I think everyone is public saw very recently the notification that was sent by a coalition of Brazilian and international NGOs to Casino, the French um, uh, retailer, um, and also to their local uh, market, uh, which is a big retailer in Brazil, saying that if they fail to take action, they will bring them to court under the duty of vigilance law in France. So I think that we have to explore really the, all the avenues that we have. That includes suing governments and uh, corporations in foreign jurisdictions. And as Christina has pointed, also going to international courts. The, my only thing about like going to the inter-American system or to the UN system is of course that it takes a lot of time, even more time than the domestic courts. Um, we saw just last week, Brazil was uh, found guilty of a violation um, in the inter-American court. And I think this case took 20 years. So, I mean, we have to be realistic and we have an emergency. That's why I think Christina, the, uh, so far, the actors, they are more interested in mobilizing domestic um, mechanisms than uh, going to the international, but it's just a matter of time for me until we have a very good case before the inter-American system as well. I will now give the floor to Joanna. Uh, probably we're really getting towards the end, but if you can comment anything about the Paris Agreement, whether it's been used by the plaintiffs, whether it's been referred to by the courts, even your own experience. 
Yeah, sure. I'll be very brief because I, I'm conscious we're getting to the end. Uh, I just wanted to make a point on the biodiversity. I think it is really important that uh, these cases start bringing biodiversity and climate together. There was a, a moment where we were bringing climate and human rights together, and it, it requires some exercise from uh, those bringing the cases to establish this link and then for courts to recognize. I think there is now a really uh, a moment for bringing the biodiversity and uh, climate systems together and, and showing that they're connected. Uh, and a, a very good way of doing this is exactly with these deforestation cases. And, and as Caio said, not only looking at the specific deforestation happening there, but how the supply chains are responsible. So it's not just you know one company, you, you can really, with data, you can really uh, uh, get a, a case that is international that brings all of this together. So I think it's a matter of time. Uh, in terms of the Paris Agreement, I think this is a, a very, very important point because as we know, the Paris Agreement uh, was uh, uh, quite an achievement, but also a very decentralized polycentric system was established where it is up to countries to, to have ambition and raise ambition. And, and the, the connections between litigation and the Paris Agreement, both in, in, in getting governments, for example, to continue ratcheting up, so continue becoming more ambitious, but also in challenging what's happening. So, for example, if uh, a, a country commits to something in Paris, but that doesn't have legislation domestically, can we think about filing a suit for that? Or can you challenge the, the NDCs that were submitted? I think there are different entry points. There are different ways in which the Paris Agreement can both be grounds for bringing uh, litigation, but also how litigation can challenge uh, 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 different approaches and lack of uh, or omission and, and etc. So there are very few cases so far that have been doing this, uh, and and it, it again it's a matter of time. We'll see more and more. Thank you very much, Joanna. Uh, it is four thirty, so I will have to close this webinar very soon. But before I do that, let me thank uh, not just the amazing three speakers, Trisha, Caio, Joanna. I have learned a lot. I have learned a lot in an interesting way, in an enjoyable way. So I really, really had uh, myself, I had a great webinar. I would also like to thank all the participants that have stayed with us until the end. Your questions were really insightful, really interesting. Uh, thanks also for comments in the chat. Um, the mix of participants was fantastic. We had people obviously from Brazil, people that knew a lot about it, a lot of people from other parts of the world that have learned a lot, just like me today, and uh, a lot of people with whom I believe we will be able to collaborate again and more. And I want to just conclude by reminding you that this was the first webinar of the Climate Change Litigation Initiative. We are planning three more between now and COP26. The next ones will probably not be country focused. They will be more focused on the scenarios. However, as we have seen, climate litigation moves so fast and sometimes things happen in a country that are so interesting. And if that does happen, we will keep an eye open, especially in countries that, as we have mentioned in our book, go beyond the usual suspects. Although, from what Caio was saying, I think Brazil will become a usual suspect very, very soon. Um, so I do hope you can join us for future C2LI webinars. We will let you know when they happen. The C2LI portal will be launched at COP26. Uh, Joanna and I are working hard to organize a fantastic full day of climate litigation events here in Glasgow. And uh, hopefully we will live in a different world by November, 2021 and we will all be able to hug each other again and have a great time in Glasgow together. A uh, very short reminder that uh, Patricia's chapter on Brazil will soon be available in the book that will be published by Springer early 2021. And together with Brazil, we have other 28 chapters from countries around the world. So it's gonna be a really interesting resource for anybody interested in climate change litigation. And lastly, if you happen to be amongst the participants and you feel that you can contribute to C2LI, that you want to know more about C2LI, that you want to collaborate with C2LI, please reach out to us. We are obviously very interested in strengthening our partnerships and collaboration. And uh, I 
can't wait to hear from you. So again, a very warm thanks to Patricia, to Caio, to Joanna, and I hope to see you soon in one of our future CQLI webinars. Thank you very much to everybody. Thank you. Bye, thank you. Thank you very much.